So uh, today is a real pleasure to have Elizabeth uh, Krause from the University of Arizona. Elizabeth uh, uh, did her undergrad at the University of Bonn and then obtained a PhD from Caltech with uh, Chris Herata. And after that, she held uh, postdoctoral positions in the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, and also Caltech. And since 2018, she was a junior faculty at the University of Arizona. And since 2022, she's, a, um, she's an assistant professor with tenure. Uh, Elizabeth is a world-renowned physicist and cosmologist. For many years, she was leading the efforts of the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration. And she still is one of the key leader, leaders of the um, Dark Energy Survey, uh, as well as the Rubin Observatory, Roman, Roman Space Telescope, and the Spherix uh, mission. Elizabeth research um, focuses on theoretical and observational cosmology, specifically using the large structure of the universe to constrain that energy, that matter, and the early universe. Um, Elizabeth received a number of awards for her uh, research and leadership. Only in the last two years, she obtained the early career award by the um, University's Research Association, the uh, Curie Award from the University of Arizona, the Maria um, Copert Mayer Award by the American Physics Society. Uh, she was also named the uh, Kavli Frontiers Fellow by the National Academy of Sciences, um, Sloan Research Fellow and Packard Fellow, and this was only for two last years. So, you know, this list continues uh, for much longer. Uh, so let me just, uh, you know, finish by uh, saying, well, by presenting some fun fact about Elizabeth. Uh, so she proposed an experiment for the European Space Agency student parabolic flight campaign, got selected, and then actually built the experiment and, uh, to experience uh, uh, weightlessness and documented that all the you know parts of her construction can actually with, withstand the 9G acceleration and did a flight. Uh, so Elizabeth, I will say no more, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Misha, for the very kind introduction. I've had a lot of uh, fun this week working with people here. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. I thought that uh, for the seminar, I would talk for, about something um, a bit different and experimental. It is uh, a new weekend program that um, we are starting um, at the University of Arizona and um, JPL. So uh, the uh, senior junior faculty on this uh, are Tim Eifler, Eric Huff, and myself. And uh, then uh, today, I will primarily present um, Papers led by two grad students at Arizona, Jia Xuan Chu and Frankel RS. And then we have uh, three more students and postdocs who are also contributing to this effort. And these are really the first steps towards weekend with our tape noise. I'll talk about what we've done so far, but I would be really interested in your feedback and questions about, say, different theory systematics that may come to your mind. So um, in my normal talks, I talk a lot about standard weak lensing which uh, you've probably heard also at Copy this week, uh, is an essential tool, tool for cosmology and galaxy evolution studies. The idea is that we start out with some background uh, traces, in this case, our background galaxies, and uh, then the light distribution gets remapped um, along the light path so that uh, the shapes of these background galaxies are distorted. And from that, uh, we can uh, probe the intervening uh, matter distribution. Uh, this is uh, a unique tool for structure growth measurements which then, of course, among many other things, leads to cosmological constraints here on other matter and S8 um, through cosmic shear from a bunch of um, current surveys. So that's an established and important tool, uh, but it is also a very difficult measurement. Um, as you've probably heard a couple of times, all these weekend measurements tend to skew late low on the um, amplitude of structure formation. And basically, every conference I go to, I get yelled at by George, Elizabeth, what have you done wrong? <laughs> uh, it's something where we still have to do a lot of cross checks and uh, show uh, through many independent measurements, in this case, through independent surveys, that yes, results hold up and that these, um, these numbers actually are reflect reality. So um, we now want to propose a different way of measuring weak lensing uh, because traditional weak lensing has a bunch of uh, challenges. So uh, we start out with background galaxies uh, for where we, so let's say for simplicity now that uh, initially these uh, shapes are randomly oriented. Uh, then we have uh, these um, uh, ellipses on the sky with an um, electricity dispersion of about 0.25. Now, uh, if there's um, gravitational lensing in front, that means that uh, these uh, randomly oriented ellipses will ever so slightly align. That's exaggerated in my cartoon here on the right. Uh, in reality, this shear is of order 0.01, 
well, the intrinsic dispersion is about 0.25. So clearly this is a statistical measurement. We need to measure the shapes of as many galaxies as we can get. So we can then average over galaxies in a patch of sky and find, find that coherent distortion. That means also that we're pushing to fainter and fainter galaxies in order to um, uh, basically um, improve the statistics. But measuring the shapes of galaxies at a signal to noise of 15 is very tricky business. So um, in order to now quantify the signal to noise uh, of uh, this measurement, it's helpful to look at a quantity called shape noise. That is the um, electricity dispersion, sigma epsilon squared, divided by number of galaxies. Just, that, that just tells us uh, how much we gain for a given sample, yeah? To do this exercise, you assume that the initial shapes are actually all the same or scale somehow? Or? So um, for now, we just assume that uh, these are somehow ellipses on the sky with random orientations. Right. That's not quite true. Uh, there are intrinsic alignments that we have to um, um, consider in the modeling. But just now to estimate the signal to noise, we just assume that these galaxies are randomly oriented. And then this number just um, is a measurement uh, that um, tells us something about the dis dis distribution of shapes of galaxies, um, or that is something that uh, we uh, cannot predict, but it's uh, calibrated from data. Uh, but now then, as we statistically build up um, our measurement, uh, the noise, um, of course, scales as one over number of galaxies. So sigma epsilon squared over number of galaxies is a key number to keep in mind. Of course, then, as we push to fainter and fainter galaxies, systematics become more and more important. Um, and eventually, for example, we'll look at so many galaxies that for um, Rubin, a lot of them will uh, be on top of each other, and it will be really difficult to tell uh, what, uh, what is the weak lensing effect on two overlapping galaxies and what are the respective redshifts. So pushing to more and more galaxies clearly has its limitations. What we now want to do is to use kinematic information to break the degeneracy between shape and shear. So that we then hopefully can do um, a weak lensing measurement on a per galaxy basis. Basically, uh, the uh, um, idea is kinematics will tell us the intrinsic shapes, and then we'll um, measure the difference between observed shape and intrinsic shape predicted from kinematics. That uh, then takes out this whole um, electricity dispersion term. So um, if we able, if we were able to achieve that, we would also get rid of um, a bunch of the dominant uh, systematics and lenses. We would not be subject to photometric redshift uncertainties anymore because we already have to take spectra to get kinematics. And we are also not subject to intrinsic alignments. Of course, you'll directly uh, realize taking spectra is more um, expensive, uh, which means that uh, we really have to um, optimize this term here, electricity dispersion divided by number of galaxies, and see uh, if we can um, push down uh, this uh, intrinsic shape noise so much that we can uh, get away with a um, much smaller galaxy sample. Now, again, in a cartoon, just to illustrate this uh, degeneracy between um, uh, sh shape and shear, uh, let's say just we have two disk galaxies here. One of them is sheared but face on, and the other is inclined but not sheared. They would look the same in an image. That's exactly this uh, degeneracy. But if we now take spectra, we would find in this case along the major axis that there's a flat, there's, there's no rotation curve uh, telling on telling us that this galaxy must have been observed face on and any electricity is due to shear. Uh, in this case, where we do see a rotation curve, we know uh, that it is inclined. Uh, I say here now um, to exaggerate, but not sheared. In reality, like it will be some mixture of inclination and shear. And that's what we want to use. Let's uh, first illustrate uh, the uh, effect of um, weak lensing on uh, galaxy photometry and kinematics, uh, where I'm showing here uh, um, for the two different uh, shear components, one along the major axis of a galaxy and one then at 45 degrees from it, what happens to photometry. And that's uh, the um, gray lines here. Dash is before shear. Uh, uh, solid gray contours is after shear. So you can see that uh, in the case of a she shear along the major axis, the galaxy just gets switched. Uh, in the case of um, a shear uh, uh, along the 45 degree axis here, the cross component, uh, the um, galaxy um, basically get, gets twisted, or the photometry gets twisted. Similarly, then of course, the velocity field gets remapped, and those are the um, red to blue lines. Again, dash is unlensed, uh, red is after lensing. 
Here we just have the stretching. So uh, in the case of a shear just along the major axis, basically we are remapping both photometry and kinematics to a galaxy with a different ellipticity. Uh, in the case of a cross component, uh, again, the shear gets remapped, uh, the, the velocity field gets remapped. And uh, what's interesting now is that shear is not a solid body rotation. So that means that the um, major axis in the um, photometry and kinematics um, do not coincide. So uh, in this case here, um, you will now have um, a non-zero rotation velocity along the minor axis. And the angle between the major and minor kinematic axis will not be 90 degrees. Uh, that's a shear effect that was already pointed out by Andrew Blaine in 2002, this cross component. Um, but uh, at that point, it was only possible to then measure one shear component. That's the one at 45 degrees. Uh, so in order to um, um, constrain now uh, the shear component along the major axis here, which would uh, basically correspond to uh, having a different inclination angle, we need additional information. Um, there have been some applications already using only that um, angle between um, kinematic major and minor axis to estimate a shear, and that is in very constrained co um, uh, geometry. If we um, go to the case of cluster or galaxy galaxy dancing, where basically one mass dominates um, uh, the entire field of view, and we think that most of the shear is just from the central mass, uh, then we know uh, the tangential direction. And with that, we can uh, use just the measurement of um, the um, uh, kinematic um, um, asymmetry uh, to uh, really, um, con really do um, cluster or galaxy galaxy dancing. But that only works uh, in this specific uh, geometry. Uh, they're uh, basically saying this, uh, this is the um, uh, uh, direction to the mass doing the dancing is what breaks the genes. It has been uh, applied by a bunch of groups. We now want to um, access uh, that uh, second component of shear using the Taylor-Fisher relation. So we want to use um, for disk galaxies uh, the scaling, scaling relation between circular velocity and, and um, absolute luminosity of stellar mass. This is something that has been observed uh, to be in place uh, up to metrics of uh, about two uh, with a scatter of 0 0.05 dex. So this is a fairly tight uh, scaling relation. Um, and the idea then, of course, is uh, we measure the observed um, rotation velocity, predict the circular velocity uh, from uh, the absolute magnitude, and from the difference, we get, um, get the inclination angle with some scatter. So the red trend line here is the Fisher relation. And the blue type points are measurements that are uncorrected for inclination. Uh, in standard observation studies so far, uh, people have uh, tried to um, inverse that to get um, the uh, inclination corrected um, measurement shown as the um, black crosses. Uh, that, of course, only works locally where there is no shear. We instead directly want to use this offset here to estimate inclination, and with that, the unlensed galaxy shape. That's the idea in principle. Of course, now we have to uh, first show that this type of measurement is actually uh, feasible at realistic signal to noise. Uh, so we've set up um, um, detailed uh, simulations of um, uh, long slit spectra of galaxies. We put in a Fisher prior. And because these simulations are so slow, we've also developed a fast 2D forward model that we can then use in MCMC fits. So from our simulation code, we then produce mock data vector consisting, of course, uh, a simulated image in a signal to noise of about 100 in this case, which is typical of targeting data, say, for DESI. The galaxies for which we will get spectra will, of course, be much brighter. We don't have to worry about all the difficulties in estimating shear for very faint galaxies. And uh, then we have um, our slit spectra, so um, uh, as a function of wavelengths here, along the major axis and the minor axis. And uh, then a, a simple, uh, the simple 2D parametric uh, model um, produces, an, again, an image in the spectrum. We run an MCMC. And in the end, we constrain shear for each galaxy. So that means we have to uh, basically fit a detailed kinematic model to each galaxy uh, and re recover shear on a per galaxy basis. That's, of course, um, quite a process. Uh, and we first have to show that we can actually do this as realistic signal to noise. So let's go. So our um, simulations of, um, are based on the uh, public and widely used Gelsum code uh, for the image and spectrum modeling. 
And then we account for sky emission, atmosphere, instrument, and CCD effects, and the point spread function. Uh, so that at the end, the noise uh, properties of our simulated mock spectrum um, are quite similar to, uh, say, um, Deimos, standard Deimos observations. The fast uh, forward model um, implements just a bunch uh, of um, basically uh, linear algebra transformation, starting from um, an arc tangent um, a rotation model in the phase on coordinates, then um, going to uh, the um, um, in including the inclination to get to the aligned source plane, accounting for some rotation, uh, doing the uh, shear mapping, so we end up in the observed coordinates and then have our um, spectrum um, based on that uh, initial idealized rotation curve. Uh, and then finally, we put a slip mask over that. But importantly, this fast forward model really takes a fraction of a second, so we can easily run it in, in an MCMC. So let's do that. First case, um, just a signal to noise, but no actual noise in the data. So here we just want to um, demonstrate that it's actually feasible to fit 11 or 12 uh, parameters to each galaxy and recover shear. So we uh, fit a synthetic deep two light spectra, <laughs> noise of 30, so nothing too, too, um, too ambitious observationally, and uh, fit those as our first uh, um, fast forward model. Important, I, I only show here the two shear components uh, and the inclination um, as an example. Importantly, we do recover the input, uh, both input shear components. Uh, our uh, constraining power depends quite a lot on the inclination angle, uh, which makes sense because there is no way to fit 12 parameters to a completely edge on galaxy. So that trend makes sense. And we know now that fitting 11 parameters to each galaxy is not hopeless. That's the first step. The important question then is uh, whether this actually works on noisy data. Uh, because the fitting, of course, is a nonlinear um, uh, process. So we have to check that noise causes only scatter, not biases, for this to be viable for cosmic tree measurements. So then we generate uh, a lot of galaxies at um, different inclinations, following the standard uh, just a random distribution, and uh, generate a large number of noise realizations for each of these galaxies. Each noise realization uh, then um, is fitted through an MCMC process, so that we get their shear estimates, and uh, we um, get the mean posterior averaging over all these noise realizations. So then we have to check that uh, after averaging over noise realizations, the mean posterior is still unbiased. And if so, we can then use this procedure to also estimate realistically what the shape noise of this of um, this type of measurement is. So let's first uh, talk about noise biases or not. Here you can see our misestimates of the two shear components as a function of inclination angle, where you can see that uh, uh, there is no significant bias um, of, uh, in the shear estimates uh, at our current sensitivity. Of course, we will have to push that uh, further uh, in future studies, but overall, this looks uh, promising. And um, now averaging over um, galaxy distributions, we also uh, show that we um, uh, recover the um, uh, input components um, correctly. So uh, in this case, um, you're putting in just a um, shear along the major component, none among, along the um, uh, minor um, direction or direction, and vice versa. So uh, we find basically uh, in the language of cosmic shear that so far there is no significant multiplicative biases uh, in the shear calibration uh, for this type of method. Of course, uh, again, that's something that we will need to uh, improve the precision, especially for cosmic shear in the future. But many weak lensing uh, measurement ideas uh, uh, died at this stage already. So this is good news. Given that we have a so far viable message, we can then uh, finally estimate our shape noise. This is now averaged over the whole, um, um, over um, a random orientation of these galaxies, population averaged. And, and um, you then see uh, the sigma epsilon value for the two components as a function of the spectrum signal to noise. Of course, better signal to noise leads to a smaller shape noise per galaxy. And the blue points here are for the um, total 11 parameter model per galaxy. If uh, in, in the future we were to realize that galaxies are simpler and we don't need all these parameters, but that we can reduce our model and still recover here, uh, that would uh, be a tremendous gain um, in constraining power. 
So the, the goal of the future will be to get this uh, model as simple as possible. And if we just uh, restrict to galaxies with an inclination uh, of uh, sine i less than 0.6, that is also an enormous gain. Simply because we avoid those cases that it get closer and closer to edge on where it gets more difficult to fit. So that means that we, um, with a sigma epsilon about a factor 10 smaller than traditional lensing, uh, we can um, afford um, smaller sample sizes and more expensive measurements that is the expected for galaxies. At face value, this would mean that we can get away with a sample size that's a factor 100 smaller. Now, expanding a little bit uh, on the um, dependence of shape noise on inclination angle. Um, let's uh, look at this as a function of our cut uh, in inclination angle. Importantly, first here, um, is uh, just the number of galaxies for a randomly oriented population of these galaxies, where of course then most galaxies will be um, at high inclinations. So, uh, for example, cutting at uh, sine i of 0.6 means that we only include about a third of the galaxies. But uh, the uh, shape noise, um, now a scale for the number of galaxies, only increases very slowly as we push to um, um, high inclinations. That's now um, a hint of how to optimize galaxy selection later on. If we're really uh, limited by the field of view of our survey, that of course means that we should still get as many galaxies as possible in the field of view. But if, we're, uh, if um, it's rather the case that we can easily saturate the number of slip masks uh, in a given pointing, then it makes sense to focus on low inclination galaxies first and push to wider area. So that will then depend later on, on uh, what type of facilities can be used for this measurement. As a pilot study, we're now doing galaxy-galaxy lensing uh, with deep two slip, uh, uh, slip spectra. So um, that means we now use archival data in a pencil beam survey. Uh, there's about 280 CMAS galaxies uh, in the deep two footprint. Now CMAS um, is one of the standard uh, galaxy samples for which uh, people have measured galaxy-galaxy lensing over and over and over. For example, the uh, uh, light blue shaded region here those are the arrow bars for galaxy galaxy lensing with CMAS uh, in the CFHT footprint. So that's a survey area about a factor 100 larger than the deep two area. Now, uh, these uh, arrow bars here show our forecasts for how well, well we can do kinematic, well, do kinematic lensing using the deep two sources as the um, uh, weak lensing source galaxies. And um, just for comparison, those wide orange areas. That's how well we would do with uh, traditional weak lensing uh, in, the, in the D2 footprint. Um, there's still a bunch of um, technicalities to be worked out because D2 was not designed for kinematic lensing. So the um, slit direction is just um, some direction. It is not, uh, it is just one slit per galaxy, not aligned with major or minor um, axis. So that means that uh, now for this galaxy galaxy lensing problem, we can have to say that probably the uh, five or 10 CMOS galaxies nearest to the source galaxy dominate um, the given signal. And then um, we wrote down a massive Bayesian hierarchical model that um, directly uses all the lens and source positions. Um, and that's uh, a bit more difficult to fit, but that's uh, just a technical challenge we still have to overcome. Hopefully with that, we can then um, demonstrate that we can uh, measure precise um, halo masses for much smaller lens samples. That will be interesting, of course, for cluster cosmology, where we have very few um, objects. Um, and want to maximize uh, the precision of measurement. And it's really interesting for galaxy evolution because this will allow us to um, then split galaxy samples, say by environment or other um, properties and really do uh, assembly bias uh, measurements and such through halo mass measurements um, in a way that was not possible before. The next um, um, resensing application of course is cosmology. And here I want to uh, briefly talk through some cosmic shear forecasts uh, for Roman. So Roman uh, will have um, a wide uh, field of view. Um, shown here uh, as an example uh, overlaid on, on a ground-based uh, image with space quality imaging and uh, also GRISM data. So uh, the idea here is uh, to just analyze the already planned uh, Roman observations differently. We will have space-based um, imaging and GRISM um, data with a resolution of um, about um, 460. And the standard uh, Roman survey will provide 2,000 square degrees of overlapping imaging and, and uh, GRISM data. 
The question then just is whether the grid measurements are uh, sufficient to measure this kinematics. And here we can at least extrapolate from uh, previous HSC studies, uh, where the um, um, Bifield chemistry uh, G141 um, prism has a three times worse resolution than Roman, uh, but they uh, recover rotation velocities with a precision of um, about 15 to 30 kilometers per second. So now that is already um, a kinematics measurement that is uh, similar to uh, the scatter in the television relation. Uh, so we can ex extrapolate from that that the resolution of the Roman grism should be good enough um, to do this, ki this kinematics. We've then gone through these of image and spectrum simulations for Roman, um, testing the effect of shear on both this um, um, H-band images in Roman and the grism um, image. So here with shear, without shear, and the difference. And then going again through our fitting procedure, uh, we can estimate the shape noise per galaxy. Additionally, uh, Jeshon uh, did a detailed reweighting of the Cosmos and Candles catalogs to estimate how many disk galaxies we will be able to use uh, for this type of measurement. So for that, we um, put a bunch of uh, additional um, selection cuts uh, on the um, expected um, highlighted survey spectroscopic sample. So there is uh, some cut on emission line strings. We also need a sufficient half side radius to do this detailed fitting um, and a, a certain uh, threshold brightness. Uh, and then, um, assuming it has a moderate 50% success rate, we um, estimate that we should have about four galaxies per square arc minute for this kinematic landing study, uh, uh, with um, sigma epsilon about 0 0.035. On the other hand, the number of standard lensing source galaxies is a factor 10 larger, and sigma epsilon is also about a factor 10 larger. Now, what matters really is sigma epsilon squared over n, so um, we think that uh, we might be um, in a useful spot here for kinematic lens. Propagating that through to some um, cosmology forecasts, and here you can see uh, constraints on like energy equation of state parameters and also omega m s8 for traditional weak lensing in black and then kinematic lensing with different systematics assumptions in blue and orange. Important point is that uh, we expect about a factor of 3.6 enhancement in dark energy constraints and almost a factor two um, enhancement in omega MS8 constraints. And that is just from analyzing the already proposed data differently, no new observations would be needed for this. Just some pipeline development and probably a few more student thesis. So I think that's quite promising. In order to get there, as with all weak lensing measurements, of course, we have to talk about systematics. In traditional weak lensing, uh, the uh, main uh, systematics are redshifts because we have photometric data. Not an issue for kinematic lensing that uses spectroscopic data and spectroscopic observations to begin with. Shape measurements for traditional weak lensing are really challenging because we're at low signal noise. But it's not um, uh, so uh, difficult at high signal noise that, that we have in the um, photometric targeting for spectroscopy for spectroscopic samples. In traditional weak lensing, another category are intrinsic alignments, which have to be uh, modeled uh, in the cosmology inference. And there's still a lot to be worked out of what the actual shape of the intrinsic alignment power spectrum is, how it scales and redshift, whether, say, uh, blue galaxies actually um, have uh, intrinsic alignments to do tidal talking or not. So there is still a lot of um, work um, going into this box. For kinematic lensing, uh, we infer the um, unlensed but potentially intrinsic, intrinsically aligned um, shape. So that means that uh, we are not subject to traditional intrinsic alignments. When we estimate sine i, but this sine i be from the, just as total inclination angle of the galaxy, and we don't care whether that is random or from intrinsic alignments. However, of course, uh, we fit kinematics to real galaxies, uh, which uh, may of course have some interesting features. Uh, so we do need to talk a bit more about astrophysical systematics. In our current fitting pipeline, we assume that uh, galaxies are intrinsically round, that they follow a smooth circular light profile, and the rotation curve um, should better be cylindrically symmetric. That's a lot of sim simplifying assumptions, which we all have to stress test. So um, right now, um, Pranjal is analyzing um, manga galaxies. So very low redshift galaxies with a mean redshift about uh, 0.03. Uh, 
high resolution IFU data. And because these galaxies are at such a redshift, we know that there is no, um, no shear. There's basically not enough matter in front of us to a significant lens there. So we can then degrade the manga data uh, to expect its spectra to a uh, lensing inference and check, check whether the recovered shear is zero. Uh, that's still a bit of work in progress. We have a few more uh, tests to do. But so far, we find no, um, no shear bias due to um, a realistic morphology and kinematic structure. We've also developed um, um, a, a detailed kinematic lensing observation pipeline on, on Elastis TNG, so that we can now analyze um, galaxy mock images and spectra from hydro simulations. And with that, um, we are uh, trying to increase the uh, model complexity uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we really um, mitigate astrophysical uh, scatters uh, in these hydro simulations, where kinematics can be even more irregular than in the manga galaxies. That may be important for um, extrapolating to higher actions. And then the other um, test that I wanted to, to uh, mention here, because I hope that uh, people in this audience may have um, input from me, is um, tests for um, population level systematics. So uh, I mentioned that uh, um, kinematic lensing is not affected by intrinsic alignments, but there could be intrinsic alignment analogs. And by that I mean astrophysics that is correlated with the tidal field. Well, traditional lensing is just the intrinsic shape that matters, but there could, of course, be other properties uh, in, in this process that are correlated with the tidal field and, in the end, then cause, um, um, cause modulations of um, the um, estimated inclination that are correlated with the lensing of our background galaxies. I have a nice question. Like, uh, why don't you use like, the baryonic uh, telefishes or the telefishes? So, uh, so far, um, um, because the scatter may be smaller, from what I remember, the unique crystal It depends on the type of galaxy. So, it's the scatter is smaller for, for here, things like LMCs, but for Not probably the L star type spirals we're looking at, regular telephotic pressures, I would imagine. I th I, yes, uh, I think at least masses, uh, regular telefisher um, is fine. And of course, again, you want to keep the um, observations as cheap as possible. To really do detailed baryonic uh, telefisher for high range of galaxies, you would then also need imaging in a lot, lot more bands, I think. So um, this may be observational easier. So let's briefly talk about intrinsic alignment analogs still. So uh, what we actually do is we estimate the um, um, in intrinsic electricity. Uh, based on the disk scale height and uh, measured uh, inclination angle, angle. Now that measured inclination angle is uh, just um, related to the major um, um, axis rotation velocity that we measure of the galaxy, divided uh, by uh, the um, rotation velocity predicted from polyfish. Now astrophysical biases can come in uh, in basically scattering uh, the major um, axis rotation velocity uh, due to say um, kinematic substructure. Or the telefisher relation could also vary with the environment. It's not, um, not crazy to think that um, galaxies in dense environments may follow a slightly different um, telefisher relation, whether in normalization or scatter, or then um, in under dense regions. So uh, we fitted a global telefisher relation to less just TNG and went through this procedure um, to estimate uh, the um, uh, um, kinematic lensing predicted intrinsic electricity. And then we just visualize the difference um, in uh, predicted electricity uh, from Pally Fisher and what we actually measure in, in the simulations. Now, because Pally Fisher only affects uh, the uh, major axis uh, estimate, we can just visualize this here uh, as the, uh, as the um, electricity error or the bias in, in, in shear estimates. And uh, those are the, um, the, these lines in a narrow sl slab of the uh, TNG simulation. Uh, you can already see that these whiskers here are kind of randomly oriented. We then um, went through the cross correlation study uh, to check whether there is a measurable cross correlation between the um, environment induced um, uh, effects as shown here and the tidal field. And so far, we find no significant detection so that uh, these types of astrophysical effects um, don't appear to be intrinsic alignment analogs uh, for kinematic lensing. Um, when I talked with Stephen, he suggested that this might be a great candidate for separate universe studies to calibrate. Uh, the um, equivalence of uh, bias expansion uh, for um, kinematic lensing more uh, carefully. So I think that might be one of our next projects, but at least um, this uh, initial study uh, seems promising 
that we don't have a massive uh, intrinsic alignment uh, analog um, dominating our measurement. So um, to continue my uh, systematics um, uh, uh, table, intrinsic alignment analogs um, are at most a weak correlation. Uh, so far, we find no, uh, uh, no um, uh, hints for that. And for kinematic substructure, um, our tests also indicate that this is already accounted for by the Telefisher scatter. Of course, uh, when people measure the Telefisher relation and at the end uh, quote the uh, scatter um, of um, that relation, uh, they already had to deal with a, um, a galaxy morphology. So it makes sense that uh, if we just use that prior in the end, uh, that that already accounts for a lot of the scatter due to um, galaxy morphology. So then uh, to conclude, um, the main idea here is uh, that imaging in galaxy kinematics um, break the degeneracy of intrinsic galaxy shape and shear. And uh, by developing and validating a kinematic lensing analysis pipeline, um, we've now convinced ourselves that um, this uh, should lead to competitive um, weak lensing constraints. Um, the first galaxy galaxy lensing measurement with deep tools in progress. And uh, we found that, that a um, 10 times reduction in shape noise per galaxy can compensate um, for reduced source density so that we then can obtain competitive cons cosmic shear constraints, um, even with the um, already planned Roman GRISM observations. Right now, we are characterizing um, astrophysical systematics and simulations. And the next step then is to also optimize the sample selection, coming back to the question of um, how much it makes sense to push a higher inclination with directly putting fewer slits um, on, in a given observation and pushing to a um, larger area. Um, also, the three theorists are now learning to observe. We have ongoing programs uh, on LBT, MMT, and Paloma um, to uh, figure out the optimal um, uh, kinematic lensing specifications, in particular, determining our spectral, uh, um, uh, the spatial resolution requirements for spectroscopy. Uh, if we could do this with just two fibers per galaxy, um, then uh, this could be a really interesting DESI2 program, but we don't know yet whether that, that, that will quite work. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, are there any questions? Uh, so, so as you were talking about the you know, how your uh, alignment of the split and showing the velocity fields, I mean, I guess one question I have is uh, if you thought about, this is probably not practical for your Roman type sample, but maybe in terms of optimizing for another set is looking at uh, 21 centimeter. I mean, with the Wallaby survey, which is starting to really roll out results and eventually SKA, there will be, you'll have like the inter essentially an integral field spec spectrum of a bunch of galaxies. Um, now, high redshift for each one person is like, Point five, and but you know they should be pushing to higher budget. So I was wondering, you know, if you had the full, like, if you could put get an integral field spectrum for each galaxy, how much of a gain would that be over just having a single slit? So um, over a single split, sis, a slit, it would uh, in the ideal case be a factor for improvement, mm -hmm. because if we only have one single slit, we get one of the two shear components. Mm -hmm. And then at the end up being means that uh, our signal is a factor four lower, our signal to noise is a factor four lower. Of course, um, having a full um, IFU data also means more robustness to um, uh, astrophysical systematics, say from morphology or kinematic substructure. So uh, in order to really address that, uh, we need to understand whether um, all the astrophysical uh, uncertainty already is basically irreducibly in the telephysics air relation scatter or not. If, if we can uh, improve over the scanning and the relation, then it may be more than a factor of four gain. I now don't really know uh, what the expected number of galaxies in, in the Wallaby survey is, how wide area that is. Yeah, it's like the whole, like the, most of the southern sky or all of the southern sky, but I, I would need to reread the papers to see how deep they want to go. But, uh, but you know, like there you really would have a, integral fields. And then you could also, you know, for for disk people, they really don't like the face-on system. So it's sort of the opposite for you. Yeah. Like you really want the more face-on systems. Yeah. Um, 
anyways, I'm just sort of rambling and thinking, but you know. Yeah, but it's really interesting because uh, good source density at low redshift would mean that uh, we could uh, try to uh, push to um, galaxy galaxy and measurements of smaller and smaller um, yes. galaxy systems. Yeah. And uh, eventually doing this uh, for very low, uh, doing actual every lensing measurements for low mass galaxies would be super exciting. Yeah. More questions? Very many questions as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. So, if you use the same part of the sky, right? The galaxies which are visible for the sky by seeing of the noise, right? So, using the same part of the sky, I'm correcting for dictation and everything. But uh, for standard weak lensing, the size is going to be like by how many factors bigger? And what sort of improvement with your method you would expect from like a given patch of the sky, like a random patch of the sky? Because when you say that the, one of the problems with the standard one is that you have small signal to noise, yeah. but both size of the samples also by certain factors. So these forecasts for Roman are for the already planned survey, uh, just analyzing the, 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 the data differently. So the uh, traditional weak lensing forecasts here are for the expected uh, Roman survey size, uh, which I think, so that was uh, for 50 galaxies per square arc minute uh, with the um, two component trade was about 0 0.37 per galaxy. And uh, we find a factor 10 um, reduction in the shape noise and also factor 10 reduce, reduction in the, in, the, in the sample size. Mm -hmm. And since what matters in the end is sigma epsilon squared divided by a number of galaxies, um, these forecasts and say that on the same patch of sky, focusing on different galaxies, bringing in spectroscopy leads to um, significant improvements um, on constraints. Like factor of consider. Right? So, um, in, in the um, uh, like um, area of these ellipses here, it's a factor of three point six approximately, uh, which of course means um, that uh, that corresponds about a factor of ten difference in area otherwise. I guess can you compare the size of this spectroscopic sample to a typical spectroscopic survey? Is it, is it comparable or do we still more galaxies? So, um, uh, this, uh, this GRISM survey, of course, uh, will, um, I, I guess I should say, image all galaxies above some um, emission line flux threshold. And uh, that uh, still results in a denser sample than DESI. Uh, typically, at least. So I'm just wondering because then this seems a better way to use the cross. I mean, this is the spectroscopy technique adopted by Roman and uh, Euclid. Right. It's, um, interesting. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a fast way to do, and importantly, it has um, not you don't have to bring all these robot arms into space. Getting moving parts into space is a huge uh, complication. Um, but. Uh, this is something that uh, mainly works at intermediate to high redshifts. Uh, for for, for um, at, low, at lower redshifts like DESI, the targeting of individual galaxies is um, still quite an efficient way. And to push to um, higher uh, to a comparable redshifts with high sampling density, you would need concepts like mega map to do actual um, fiber spectroscopy. Of course, this um, um, prism so. Uh, Basically here, this spectrogram, um, where you have a measurement of velocity and as a function of wavelengths, um, this, this blurred out image um, is only um, useful for some kind of science. You can't do all the details, say, um, uh, um, studies of line properties as you would be able to do with the spectrum of the Yeah, so very nice talk. Uh, when the DESI alteration, you need the two five. You, you, you need like two uh, fibers. They need to be very close to each other, right? Is there any technique to do that now? So, um, well, we're still going through simulation to see whether we can propose this as a DESI two program. But there is, for example, the DESI peculiar velocity um, survey um, precursor program already, where they are doing um, coefficient measurements of, of lower electric galaxies. But that basically means you need two different slit masks. 
um, so you uh, so look at the same galaxies twice with two different slit masks. You can't just repoint the telescope as uh, you basically have to move along the major axis of each galaxy. So that can't be uh, done, done by simple repointing. That does not address the uh, minor axis component yet. That may be more challenging. But in that case, uh, doing only the major component may then be the way to go. Another question is whether one could do slightly longer integration times and try to um, actually fit the, um, the um, telefisher um, with the terminal velocity to the um, uh, spectral lines from the line width. So, what about U3? Um, because you mentioned U3 also have this prism and, and it's much earlier. So, do they have any plan to? Incorporate these in the environment. No, the grism resolution is lower, and uh, I don't know what the final word is on the um, rotation angle between the two grism pointings. Um, but uh, typically, uh, you do two pointings with the grism, rotating it by 90 degrees. I think for Euclid, it might now, now be down to an order of four degrees or so. Uh, Marco, do you know? I know that there is. Uh, I'm I'm not part of Euclid, so I have not been uh, hearing about especially things that go wrong. But the Roman will do the grism in two yes. perpendicular mm -hmm. angles. Yeah. I have a nice question about the uh, like the environmental dependence. I thought like this would be studied like people would have had spectroscopic observations of like clusters, individual clusters, uh, and uh, so this uh, in in this high density region, this would have been studied how the television rotation. In the very dense clusters, yes, but of course they don't. The, those don't really contribute um, to typical uh, lensing measurements. What really matters here is the environment of the sources, not uh, where the lensing happens. So we need to um, um, get environments uh, representative of a large source sample. Even for cluster lensing, um, typically uh, um, uh, a large cluster covers a large enough range of uh, background galaxies that they will be in different uh, environments. Which is a very quick question. Uh, the resolution of Roma will be about five times greater than hmm? uh, the resolution of Roma's grism. Mm -hmm. um, so then, how can you get to like 15 to 30 meters per second error? So, um, HST already um, gets, um, can recover kinematics of about 15 to 30 kilometers per second. So, that um, will be sub pixel uh, size. I think so. So that, that, this is uh, just from existing kinematic studies um, um, with HST. And then the Roman grism will have three times better resolution. Uh, so that means that uh, that resolution uh, will be um, smaller than the scatter and the television relation, which should be good enough for our measurement. And there is already uh, that uh, noise level of the television relation. You don't need to do it that much better. We really just need this to break the generalities, not for, for the precision measurement itself. At the beginning of your talk, you told that they will be also overlapping galaxies. Maybe you remember. Yeah. Yes. And my question, what is in the probability that uh, if you find overlapping galaxy in the Roman space telescope? So for Roman, it is better. This is mostly a problem for ground-based uh, surveys. I believe for um, Rubin LSST, mm -hmm. uh, they expect of order 15, 20% of the source galaxies to be blends. Excuse me, please repeat. 15% or so, or, to, or 15 20. 15% will be overlapping. 15 to 20% of source galaxies will be overlapping. Yes, it's so. And uh, that becomes really difficult, especially for redshift inference. If you have two overlapping galaxies yes, yes, doing both yes. yes. is kind of. But for Roman, it will like be magic. how many times it will be better for Roman from space? It will be, it will be, for example, one tenth, or it will be. It will be a lot less. I don't remember the precise yes. factor. I know where to look it up. But it's very important. Yes. And in addition, could you tell me a similar question? Uh, for LSST, for the Rubin telescope, what will be optical depths? that uh, for cluster of galaxies, what is the probability that clusters, rich clusters of galaxies will overlap? It's very low, but uh, what is the value? Do you know it? I don't know. You don't know. And nobody takes this into account, yes? Not that I'm aware of. Yes, yeah, because, uh, yeah. Uh, 
I know people who <laughs> are claiming that there are many overlapping clusters. I wish to find what is the real upper limit. Because it's uh, for, for X-ray clusters, it's impossible. Yeah. It's easy. But they are telling that in optics is possible. And so that is just nice. totally on sky or on sky, or after or after or sky or after. and for example, five three percent of clusters are overlapping. But up even to uh, R five hundred. But even um, even Ruben will at least use um red sequence template fitting like red mapper. Yes, yes. So yes. there will be some line of sight resolution already. It is not just 2D, it's uh, two and a half dimensions. Okay, People who are doing this red sample galaxies. And they are telling me that there are, they see many of them. But I do not believe this because when we see the same image on the next race, it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, projection effects uh, and contamination from line of sight can be a huge issue for optical accesses. We saw that very much uh, in, in the dark energy survey. You saw this, yes. Well, we, we had um, line of sight contamination leading to a cosmology constraint with omega man, meta of 0.16. Okay. Um, no, we did not lose half the meta in the universe, but we did not know how to properly account for um, redshift uncertainties and contamination. So to a reference where I can find these numbers. Yes. Okay. It's interesting. Okay. So the resin distribution of these galaxies users will be much lower than the traditional optical lensing survey. Right? Um, so I think it will be uh, somewhat deeper than current day surveys. It will be not as deep as Roman uh -huh. uh, because uh, we rely on, uh, on these emission line galaxies that we can't observe out to, um, to high redshift. We also need the television relation to be in place, uh, which might be a stretch at redshift um, three. But uh, if we want to study dark energy, that's of course a late time phenomenon. Uh, so for studying dark energy, it doesn't really help to um, measure growth structure in the metadominant regime more, which okay. is why it uh, still performs um, oh, quite so well. because because Roman has a high spatial resolution, so that's why you can go to very high yeah. redshift. Like, so you so may so have source uh, um, in traditional lensing, you may have sources out to redshift five, uh -huh. but um, you don't measure much, at least based on what I understand about cosmology now, measuring structure goes from redshift two to five is not that interesting. You will measure Einstein's method domination really well. Great. But that's why we do much better on the black energy constraints than on omega M S8, for which, of course, you still get gains from higher redshift. Maybe for neutrinos, there's a yeah. some incentive to go into matter domination regime. Yeah. All right. Um, so Elizabeth will be staying with us uh, the whole day today. So um, please go um, and, and chat with her. Let's stop here. Thank you. Thank you.